one o'clock on the night of January 3rd, 1961, the nation's first fatal accident from nuclear reactor operations occurred at the Atomic Energy Commission's National Reactor Testing Station, known as NRTS, about 40 miles from Idaho Falls, Idaho. The accident occurred in a prototype facility known as the Stationary Low Power Reactor Number 1, and referred to as the SL-1. The SL-1 was built as a result of a request to the AEC in 1955 by the Department of Defense for a small nuclear power plant to supply power and space heat for remote military installations. The reactor, originally designated the Argonne Low Power Reactor, or ALPR, was designed by the AEC's Argonne National Laboratory to gross specifications that called for above ground construction components that could be transported by cargo aircraft, and a reactor that could operate continuously for three years on one fuel loading. The SL-1 core was designed to meet the requirements for extended operation without refueling. The reactor was a direct cycle, natural recirculation boiling water system of 3 million watts gross thermal capacity, designed to produce 200 kilowatts of net electricity and 400 kilowatts of net energy in the form of space heat. It was installed in a cylindrical building 38 feet in diameter and 48 feet high. The building, fabricated of quarter-inch plate steel, was not designed to contain radioactive material in the event of a nuclear accident. This was so because future plants of this type are intended for operation in remote, isolated areas and the SL-1 itself was not near a populated area. The pressure vessel which holds the fuel was installed in the lower portion center, shielded by local gravel. Most of the plant equipment was installed in the middle portion of the reactor building. On August 11, 1958, the reactor went critical. That is, sustained a controlled chain reaction. And on February 5, 1959, it was turned over to Combustion Engineering Incorporated for operation. It was redesignated SL-1 to conform with military nomenclature. In addition to obtaining operating experience, Combustion assisted the military cadre in training military personnel and was responsible for the certification of reactor operators. Trainees arriving at the SL-1 after an eight-month course at Fort Belvoir, Virginia, were subjected to three weeks intensive academic instructions on the SL-1 operation and equipment, and three months training as a crew under a shift supervisor. Their training also included a detailed course in health physics. Upon passing rigid written and oral examinations by members of both the military cadre and combustion engineering boards, a trainee was assigned to a regular shift crew. At the time of the accident, the reactor had been operating for over two years and had produced 931.5 megawatt days of thermal energy. The reactor was shut down on December 23rd for maintenance and minor modifications. At 4 p.m. on January 3rd, 1961, the day shift was relieved by a three-man crew consisting of a shift supervisor, an operator, and a trainee due to be certified as an operator the following month. Their instructions were to prepare the reactor for eventual startup the next morning, including making the final connections between the control rods and control rod drive motors. According to the log, during the first half of their shift, they had pumped the water down and were reassembling the control rods. Then, at one minute after nine, an automatic alarm sounded in fire station number one, fire station number two, and the communication center of the AEC's Idaho operations office. One long and two short strokes indicated the trouble was at SL-1. The Idaho operations dispatcher broadcast the alarm over the testing station radio network, informed the security division duty officer, 
and in accordance with pre-planning, requested that a health physicist be dispatched from the materials testing reactor. In less than 10 minutes, the firemen arrived at the SL-1 and found it seemingly deserted. The temperature was 17 degrees below zero. The guard unlocked the front door to the administration building and the firemen entered. It was the quickest access to the reactor building about 100 feet away. They had a high-range radiation detection instrument and wore respiratory equipment to prevent inhaling contaminated air. There was still no evidence of personnel, fire, or smoke. But two feet inside the door, the instrument revealed low radiation levels in the fraction of a Rentgen range. The fire engine was ordered out of the area to Fillmore Boulevard for standby duty. The assistant fire chief reported radiation present at the SL-1 and at 9.20 p.m. notified Combustion Engineering, the operating contractor. He received confirmation that three SL-1 personnel were on duty. Combustion Engineering personnel immediately left Idaho Falls to join emergency operations at the SL-1 site. The chief then made another search for the men on duty before the health physicist arrived, again approaching the reactor building by way of the administration and maintenance building. He observed a 25 R per hour reading at the foot of the stairway to the reactor building. There was evidence that three men might be in the reactor room. A request was made to NRTS facilities for additional high-range radiation detection instruments, health physicists, and protective clothing. A roadblock was quickly established at the junction of Highway 20 and Fillmore Boulevard for control purposes. At 9.36, health physicists arrived with additional equipment, and one of them accompanied the assistant fire chief into the reactor building. They hoped to locate the missing men quickly. The control room was unoccupied. As they went up the stairway, the indicator swung past 200 R per hour, and they retreated hastily, but not before seeing some wreckage through the reactor operating room doorway. Meanwhile, at the Idaho Operations Office headquarters, 41 miles away in Idaho Falls, a control unit comprising the directors of AEC Health and Safety, Security, Military Reactors, and Public Information Offices was quickly mobilized. The SL-1 accident was declared a Class I disaster and immediately broadcast over the NRTS radio network. The Idaho manager assumed responsibility for overall emergency plans and procedures. Three things had to be done at once. Locate and rescue or recover the three missing personnel. Ascertain the condition of the reactor and determine how much contamination was being released to the environment. Because of the high radiation problems, protection of all personnel involved was an important consideration in every action taken. In an effort to locate the duty personnel, two SL-1 plant supervisors of combustion engineering, one a health physicist and the other an operations man, elected to enter the reactor room. Acting quickly, they located two of the men, one still alive, then took dose measurements and returned to the area gate for help. They were joined by two more combustion personnel and an AEC health physicist. All five returned to the reactor room as a rescue team.
They picked up the man who was alive and put him on a stretcher at the head of the stairs. They saw that the second man was dead, and another four-man team shortly afterward discovered the third man lodged in the ceiling, also dead. The first victim removed was taken almost immediately to an arriving ambulance which had resuscitation equipment. A nurse administered oxygen to the casualty en route to the control point, where an AEC doctor pronounced him dead at 11.14 p.m. Personnel involved in this rescue operation had received exposures up to 27 rentgens of penetrating radiation. None showed any medical symptoms or required hospitalization. All involved in the rescue operations had to be decontaminated. At the nearby gas-cooled reactor experiment facility and the central facilities dispensary, they vigorously showered and scrubbed in the decontamination rooms. A decontamination problem resulted from the all-out effort to save a life. Since the rescuers couldn't wait for special gloves, their hands required repeated scrubbing. Detergents and potassium permanganate proved to be effective. To monitor for airborne radioactivity, a chartered airplane was in the air at daybreak with an aerial survey analyzer. Very little activity above natural radiation background was detected except in the immediate vicinity of the SL-1 area. Careful observation showed no damage to the reactor building roof. With all three crew members accounted for, there was now time for instituting further safety controls. Organization of recovery teams could proceed more deliberately. Standard procedures for teams working in contaminated areas called for face masks, film badges for measuring radiation, two pairs of anti-contamination clothing, two pairs of shoe covers, and two pairs of gloves. All openings were taped to prevent seepage of contamination. From that time, progressively less contamination and exposure of personnel was experienced. And by the end of the week, the standard operational exposure limit of three retkins per quarter of penetrating radiation per person was established. Teams were thoroughly briefed to minimize exposure time. One minute was set as the time limit in high radiation fields. A health physicist accompanied each team and also acted as a timer. He remained outside high radiation fields to minimize radiation exposure. This was done to conserve available health physicists for the many operations yet to be performed. On the night of January 4th, plans were carefully laid for the recovery of the second casualty. A six-man military team of volunteers comprised entirely of the victim's fellow cadrymen was organized and briefed. It was decided that a blanket would be less unwieldy than a stretcher. The team worked in two-man relays. The first pair, accompanied by a health physicist, entered the support facilities building and carried the body from the reactor operating floor to the control room. The second pair took over at the reactor control room to bring the victim outside then carried him out of the SL-1 area through the perimeter gate. A health physicist measured the direct radiation exposure to the driver.
The emergency required other important action that same day, January 4th. Two entries were made into the reactor building to recover the logbook and a neutron detector. This led to later installation of remote reading instruments and audible alarms as a warning against further trouble with the reactor. Also, the reactor building exterior had to be surveyed from the ground for evidence of damage. There was none. Fire and ambulance equipment had to be decontaminated. The field command post, which was to serve for several weeks, had to be firmed up with additional trailers and power equipment. Medical checkups of entry personnel were carried out. Collection of scientific evidence and data went forward simultaneously with the recovery of bodies. The first positive evidence as to the nature of the accident came from a nuclear accident dosimeter recovered from the reactor building. Activation of its gold foil into radioactive gold-198 tended to indicate that an uncontrolled chain reaction had taken place. This was confirmed a day later when radiochemical analysis of a watch band buckle and pocket lighter screw disclosed copper 64. neutron capture could have transmuted naturally occurring gold-197 and copper-63 into radioactive gold-198 and copper-64. The anticipated spectrum of old fission products was found to be present. Also found were several isotopes of the uranium fuel. Iodine-131 found in sampling of air, soil, sagebrush, and animals collected near the SL-1 verified minimal release of activity from the reactor building. Within three hours after each entry into the SL-1 site, Film badges were processed to determine the precise exposures received. After the initial entry, no personnel received more than nine Rentgen's gamma exposure. Special data processing procedures had been initiated by January 4th, involving two or more film badges daily for many individuals. Total radiation exposure was tabulated on summary cards. Reports were issued daily by name, date of exposure, and amounts of radiation chargeable to the SL-1 incident. Later, a daily breakdown was issued according to radiation dose and summary of individual accumulated exposures. This information was used in scheduling assignments, planning operations, and in otherwise limiting the activities of individuals. The data also proved to be invaluable as a check on the accuracy and effectiveness of health physics controls. 
By the morning of January 5th, direct radiation checkpoints covering the entire SL-1 area were being surveyed every two hours, and a survey grid was plotted to a radius of 2,000 feet. Calculations were made from readings of direct radiation from the reactor building. As of mid-January, direct radiation levels ranged from 0 0.002 rentgens per hour at 2,000 feet to 1.1 rentgens per hour at 100 feet from the reactor. In contrast, at the top of the reactor, the readings were approximately 1,000 rentgens per hour. Film badges routinely placed at one-mile intervals on Highway 20 read less than 10 millirentgens, total dose for a 12-hour period beginning five hours before the accident occurred. Nineteen radio-controlled air sampling stations were started less than an hour after the accident happened. Later, a special network of 11 high-volume constant air monitors was established during January and operated through March 6th. None of the surveys showed any radiological hazard to persons or animals beyond the immediate vicinity of the reactor. On the afternoon of January 5th, an official photographer accompanied by a health physicist entered the high radiation zones at the outer edges of the reactor operating floor to obtain needed still pictures. This was repeated on January 8th with another photographer. Working in radiation fields of 500 retgens per hour, the two photographers were limited to 30 seconds of picture taking each. Using these photographs and other information, careful preparations were made for the recovery of the third body. An Army radiological assistance team from the Dugway Proving Grounds, Utah, offered to assist in the recovery effort for practical experience and training. A quick series of briefings prepared them for their role in a carefully coordinated plan to free and remove the third victim. The third body could not be removed by direct methods. It was situated where radiation levels were most intense, directly above the reactor. Also, there was concern that a heavy shield plug blown from the reactor vessel head into the ceiling might fall on the reactor and jar dislodged fuel elements into a second critical mass. The only recourse was to improvise a long mechanical arm that could breach the freight doors at the second story level of the reactor building, retrieve the body and shield plug as they were dislodged, and lower them to the ground. A hastily fabricated wedge on the boom of a mobile crane was used to pry apart the sliding freight doors. Then a five by 20 foot stretcher-like apparatus was fastened to the crane jib as a catching net. Specially designed and fabricated for this recovery operation, it was carefully maneuvered into the narrow space between the top of the reactor shielding blocks and the rail of the overhead crane. Here and during subsequent remote control operations, H.K. Ferguson Company, a construction contractor, rendered extensive support. Finally, five nights after the accident, 22 volunteers working in relays succeeded in removing the body from the reactor building. On the morning of January 9th, it was transferred from the stretcher to a cast and transported to a shielded facility for decontamination. Medical studies show that two of the men were killed instantly, and the third died of multiple injuries received at the time of the accident. An eight-man medical monitoring team from Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory assisted NRTS physicians in decontamination of the bodies. Gamma-emitting particles embedded by the explosion greatly complicated this work. Considerable success was achieved, however, by washing and scrubbing, including the use of detergents. The use of melting ice proved to be an effective automatic washing technique that minimized radiation exposure time for medical team members. The lining of standard metal caskets and vaults with lead sheeting resulted in final gamma readings at the outer surfaces of the vaults 
not exceeding 300 milliroentgens per hour generally. This was sufficiently low to permit shipment. On January 13th, the bodies were released to the Department of Defense, which then arranged for burial services in accordance with wishes of the families at private and national cemeteries. This completed phase one of the SL-1 operation. Starting with a mock-up of the reactor building at a nearby fire station training tower, phase two of the SL-1 incident operations concentrated on determining if the reactor was in fact nuclearly safe. That is, that it would not undergo another chain reaction. Up to this point, emergency operations had been carried out by the AEC. On January 13th, the responsibility for determining the condition of the reactor was turned over to the operating contractor. Proposals from Combustion Engineering were approved by IDO for remote control viewing of the reactor top head and the interior of the reactor vessel using both motion picture and television cameras on the end of a cherry picker crane. These remote controlled operations made it possible to avoid further personnel entries for the next five months or until June 2nd. The mock-up operations also made it possible to perfect techniques for placement and operation of cameras and probes. It was hoped that the pictures not only would affirm that a second nuclear excursion could not occur, but also disclosed what initiated the accident. After several days of rehearsal, the first entry into the reactor building was attempted. Equipment attached to the boom of the crane was maneuvered inside the reactor operating room through the freight doors by personnel operating the crane from a lead-shielded cab. The crane operator was guided by observers who could see directly into the reactor operating floor from a 30-foot tower 200 feet away. With field glasses, every move could be closely spotted for the man on the ground. Thanks to this arrangement and the extensive mock-up training, the equipment was successfully positioned. First films taken of the reactor head area showed that six nozzles were open to the atmosphere. Only one appeared to be completely free of obstructions. Films taken looking down through the nozzle openings revealed extensive damage to the visible part of the core and to the control rod shroud. Control rod extensions still protruding up through the nozzles indicated that most of the control rod blades were still in the core region. The central rod blade appeared to be ejected from the core. Closed circuit television cameras specially fabricated for radiation resistance also permitted remote controlled observations. These were recorded on motion picture film in a canvas enclosed truck. These lacked definition but had greater flexibility. The operator could be instructed to hold on certain scenes or move more quickly to something else. The core appeared to be expanded radially and at least one major hole appeared to be discernible. The center of the core was obscured from view. The tops of fuel elements were visible and appeared to be twisted, collapsed, and moved from their original position. All the control rod shrouds appeared to be partly collapsed. The outer shrouds were displaced toward the vessel wall. The central control shroud, number nine, appeared to have been partially ejected upward from the core. Other components appeared to be twisted, collapsed, and displaced. The films obtainable did not prove or disprove that the vessel might be cracked or otherwise damaged. Other photo entries were made with a shielded, remotely controlled miniature camera. It produced still pictures that had to be greatly enlarged but more completely defined the condition and damage to the core. 
Contrary to earlier interpretations, the films did not verify that there was water in the vessel. Subsequently, chemical probes containing potassium permanganate crystals confirmed assumptions that the vessel was dry at the time of the measure. Official conclusions eventually confirmed earlier indications that the reactor was nuclearly safe as long as nothing was done to change its unmoderated condition. The air temperature above the reactor head was 47 degrees Fahrenheit. Inside the vessel, about seven inches above the core, it was 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And at contact, presumably with debris on top of the core, it was 98 degrees Fahrenheit. First estimates of the radiation field in the reactor room were calculated to be approximately 1,000 R per hour. By late April, the radiation levels had decreased to the 200 R per hour range. Films from a pinhole camera spotted several locations and sources of high gamma radiation activity outside the reactor vessel, presumably from reactor components blown from the core by the force of the explosion. Calculations of the energy needed to cause the observed damage to the ceiling and the reactor indicate that the explosion was sufficient to create an internal pressure of at least 500 PSI. From the presence of short-lived yttrium-91M, one of the daughters of strontium-91 found in clothing samples, the total fissions were estimated to be 1.5 times 10 to the 18th, or one and a half billion billion fissions. These early calculations showed that the total energy released in the accident was at least 50 megawatt seconds. These levels are equivalent to the energy released by from 2 to 10 pounds of TNT. Beginning shortly after the accident, the SL-1 access road was regularly scanned for contamination tracked out by vehicles leaving the reactor area. Radiological crews cleaned up the hotspots. Wherever possible, vacuum cleaners were used to remove radioactive and other particulate material to the burial ground. In some instances, the activity was leached into the permeable soil with water hoses. In stubborn cases, it was necessary to seal the road surface with resin or neoprene sprays to prevent the spread of contamination. Some valuable lessons were learned early from the SL-1 experience. It is important to have high-range survey instruments that are readily available. These should range to 5,000 R per hour or greater. Special methods must be incorporated into pre-planning for handling highly contaminated and radioactive casualties. A movable lead shield with arm holes permits close work with minimum exposures. Also, lead shielding jackets and full face masks to accommodate eyeglasses. Planning for around-the-clock field operations also pays off. It must be assumed that hundreds of personnel capable of performing a variety of tasks may be needed. For example, photographers were an important requirement. It may be necessary to rely on extensive support from operating and construction contractors, from other AEC installations, and from military organizations. An urgent need for the conservation of health physicists may arise. In the SL-1 operations, more than 80 health physicists were used to advantage during the first week. These were supported by more than 130 other personnel experience re-emphasized the importance of taking precautions to avoid unnecessary exposures where contamination and high radiation are involved. Although several hundred individuals participated, only 14 of the 100 persons active in the first 24 hours received radiation exposures of five or more Rentgens of gamma, and none more than 27 R. Subject medical checkups did not disclose any medical symptoms, and no one was hospitalized. 
The SL-1 accident had little or no adverse effects on the environment outside the immediate reactor area. Life went on as usual in surrounding communities. Repeated surveys and samplings of air, water, soil, vegetation, animals, and milk have revealed very little contamination above background levels. Prompt and factual release of information from the start alleviated public concern. With little public excitement, and no sensationalism, a certain recognition was gained of the fact that hazards in the nuclear field, as with those of any other industry, can be dealt with effectively. Regrettable though the SL-1 accident was, out of it has come important information both to reactor technology and to administrative procedures govern reactor development. Since the SL-1 was not operating at the time of the accident, the Commission's safety program for shutdown maintenance has benefited from the resulting re-evaluation. Another constructive aspect was the containment of radioactive particulate matter by a building not designed for that purpose. At no time was there any serious hazard to people and animals, even in the close vicinity of the SL-1 site. This film on phases one and two of the SL-1 recovery operations was completed as phase three sought to determine what destroyed the reactor. Under contract with General Electric Company's Idaho staff, the work of decontamination and taking the reactor apart piece by piece went forward. It was a tediously slow process, extending into the following year. Various potential mechanisms that could have caused the excursion had to be explored. No unknown phenomenon was expected, however. This first fatal accident, in 19 years of successful reactor operations activity, has been thoroughly investigated from the start by several committees, composed of nuclear experts and other scientists. The investigation will not be complete until continuing studies bring a fuller understanding of what was involved and what can be learned for the advancement of reactor safety technology. in the United States, an uncontrolled nuclear excursion occurred at the Atomic Energy Commission's SL-1 facility at the National Reactor Testing Station, better known as NRTS in Idaho. All three men performing maintenance on the reactor during shutdown were killed. Immediately after the accident, a three-phase recovery program was initiated. Phase one, lasting six days, consisted of executing pre-planned emergency procedures, recovering the casualties, and determining the extent of radioactivity release to the environs. During phase two, from January 10, 1961 to late April, 1961, Combustion Engineering Incorporated, the SL-1 operating uh, contractor, was responsible for determining the nuclear safety status of the reactor. 
safety being a paramount consideration, no personnel were allowed to enter the reactor building during this period. All investigating, viewing, and probing was accomplished with the use of remotely operated equipment. With the aid of TV systems, photographic equipment, and water and temperature detecting uh, probes, the core was determined to be devoid of any moderating water, and the reactor was declared nuclearly safe. The commission has issued a separate motion picture on phases one and two of the SL-1 accident. Phase three of the accident recovery effort was aimed at discovering what caused the nuclear excursion. A contract for this portion of the operations was awarded to the General Electric Company. Its responsibilities were to gather evidence pertaining to the accident, repair the facility for core removal, recover the core for uh, examination, demolish the reactor building, decontaminate the SL-1 site to habitable status, and as a fact-finding group, uh, present uh, an accident analysis to the AEC. To understand phase three work better, it is essential to review the situation as it existed before and after the accident. The accident occurred in the reactor building, which is divided into three main areas. The uppermost section contained an air-cooled condenser with associated louvers, fan, and motor. The middle portion was the main operating area where the reactor head was located, slightly below floor level. The control rod drive mechanisms penetrated the reactor head. Biological shield blocks surrounded the head during operation. The lower portion of the building housed the reactor vessel with a core in the lower region. Around the core was a gravel biological shield. During the interval between January 3rd and May 17, 1961, the state of the reactor operations room had not been disturbed. Essentially, all items and debris were in their original post-accident location. The shield blocks were in the same place as in pre-accident maintenance, having been moved back for access to the reactor. Vessel insulation material, steel punchings, fine gravel, and blotting paper were strewn over the floor. One of the control rod shield plugs ejected from the vessel head nozzles was lodged in the damaged ceiling. Two other shield plugs could not be accounted for, but were later found in the overhead fan room. A fourth plug was observed to be lying across the reactor head. Any attempt during phase two to move or disturb this component might have jeopardized nuclear safety. For example, by uh, causing precariously perched fuel to fall into the core region. Remote viewing access to the vessel interior was limited to the only nozzle that was completely unobstructed. However, evidence that the core was dry uh, permitted removal of the interfering plug by remote means. TV monitoring greatly facilitated this task. Greater photographic exploration of core damage was now possible. The plug was taken to one of the laboratories used for analysis work. This work proceeded simultaneously with a site recovery effort. Now, before commencing extensive decontamination efforts on the building, definite steps were taken to prevent physical hazard to working personnel. As standard procedure, participating personnel were thoroughly briefed beforehand at a control point 500 feet from the SL-1 site. Each man was made aware of his assignment, the time allowed, health physics procedures, and what to do in case of unforeseen accidents. Nuclear detectors installed soon after the accident were routinely checked to ensure their operability as an early warning in the event of further nuclear activity. The reactor was deemed nuclearly safe as long as nothing was done to change its unmoderated status. Threatening this status was a 1,000 gallon tank of demineralized water suspended from the ceiling of the reactor operations room. On June 2nd, 1961, the first personnel entry into the reactor building since January 9th was to drain the tank in the operations room. 
The crew attached a garden hose to the tank and drained the water to the ground after making sure it was free of contamination. Another early safety precaution was the removal of oxygen and acetylene bottles and other readily combustible materials from the operations room floor. In event of fire, water could not be used for fear of causing another criticality should it get into the core. Evaluation of various plans for core removal and site cleanup depended on knowing the pattern of radioactive contamination within the building. Synchronized photo and radiation surveys of the operations floor indicated a nearly symmetrical zone of radiation. In the five months since January 3rd, the levels had dropped from more than 1,000 R per hour to approximately 150 R per hour over the reactor, decreasing radially to approximately 30 R per hour at the building perimeter. To determine how much of the radiation was coming from the reactor proper, the bags of lead shot were inserted into the open reactor nozzles. This lowered the overall radiation less than 10%, confirming that the accident had spread high-level contamination throughout the building. Also, that a major decontamination program faced the contractor. Scattered insulation and blotting paper had tended to concentrate the contaminated water from the reactor vessel into high sources of radiation. And recommendations based on the contamination study were made to an ad hoc committee which had been appointed by the AEC to evaluate and propose final disposition of the SL-1 reactor. A plan was agreed upon for removing the reactor vessel, complete with core, to a large hot shop at the north end of the site for dismantling rather than dismantling them in place. By June 1961, lower radiation levels and the assured nuclear safety made it feasible to proceed with direct rather than remote decontamination and dismantling of the building. December 1 was set as the target date for removal of the reactor vessel in order to avoid adverse winter conditions. Donning anti-contamination clothing, large numbers of recruits assisted in the cleanup activity. Each man wore a belt containing 18 film badges to monitor the highly directional beta radiation exposure. Complete taping and masking controlled body contamination and inhalation of radioactive aerosols. Fine particulate material tended to penetrate even two sets of coveralls. So a disposable plastic suit was worn for additional protection. Reading dosimeters were taped to the suits to provide on-the-spot monitoring of exposures from radiation. Vacuum cleaning was a major decontamination technique. An improvised vacuum system developed to operating experience consisted of 50 feet of hose running down from the working area to a 15 horsepower positive displacement rotary blower with a shielded 55 gallon collection drum and bags mounted on a truck bed. Gross clutter, such as iron punchings, blotting paper, and insulation, had to be shoveled into cans. These cans now represented new concentrated sources of radiation and were removed by remote means through the freight door. Another remote removal method was the use of an electromagnet to remove iron punchings from the higher fields of radiation. It met with limited success. All loose debris retrieved from the floor was shipped to the hot shop for inventory. Every item that might improve understanding of the accident had to be examined. As the cleanup progressed, the contaminated concrete blocks proved to be major obstacles as well as being sources of radiation. The heavy blocks were skidded across a greased steel apron to the freight doors and allowed to drop onto a pile of sand which served as a shock bed to prevent breakup. To minimize exposures, cleanup near the reactor was left until last. This area, including the reactor head, was now the highest source of radiation. 
Temporary shielding in the form of a two-inch steel plate was placed over one particularly high source of radiation next to the reactor. Also, bags of lead or steel shot were placed over and around the head. Radiation on the operations room floor, except over the reactor head, was now down to 15 R per hour generally. But a radiation survey of the ceiling indicated major levels of radiation. The excursion had forced contaminated water and debris through holes in the damaged ceiling. Originally, a ladder and narrow airlock provided access to the fan floor. Safer and easier access was gained by cutting through the outside wall of the building and erecting a large outside stairway to the fan room level. Preceded by a health physics survey, a photographer entered the reactor building to obtain photos of the general conditions. These photographs were used to brief personnel, the spotlighting key items to be collected as cleaning progressed, such as shield plugs, pieces of drive racks, and broken C-clamp. Floor vacuuming was again employed, followed by placement of quarter-inch iron plate on the floor for personnel shielding. Cleaning efforts continued alternately in the fan room and immediately around the reactor head as radiation levels dictated. During the first two months of phase three, entry times were in the order of one to three minutes, resulting in a total of only 16 man hours of cleanup in the reactor building proper. A bell alarm system installed in the working areas was used to control how long workers could stay in the reactor building. Despite general cleanup of the fan loft, radiation sources in excess of 50 Rentkins per hour remained within the relatively inaccessible parts of the condenser gear. In order to lift the pressure vessel, the fan, condensers, and ducting had to be removed. The contaminated fan room components were cut from their mountings and lifted from the building. Safety ropes were required for all high elevation work. To protect the reactor vessel from inadvertent flooding by rainwater, a protective plate was placed over the roof hole during non-working hours and bad weather conditions. The removed equipment lying around in the SL-1 yard soon posed an additional problem in the form of unnecessary background exposure to personnel. A careful study confirmed the desirability of opening a new burial ground specifically for SL1 degree. The survey indicated that 81,000 cubic feet of burial space would be needed. The estimated personnel exposure that would have been required to cut, package, and transfer the contaminated equipment to the existing NRTS burial ground would have exceeded the contractor's allowable exposure for a three-month period. This consideration alone justified opening a new burial site 1,600 feet away from the SL-1. Also avoided was possible contamination of 13 miles of site and public roads leading to the more distant NRTS burial ground. All material not being directly examined for accident evidence was transported without any decontamination to the burial trenches north of the SL-1 site. The trenches were backfilled to approximately two feet of overburden or until radiation readings were less than one MR per hour at the ground surface. Removal of the grossly contaminated equipment enabled personnel working in more tolerable radiation fields of less than five R per hour to prepare the vessel and building for extraction of the reactor. The core structure had to be carefully inspected to verify whether it could withstand the 40 mile transport to the hot shop. A boroscope examination of the underside of the core through an 18-foot long hole bored to the gravel basin vessel wall indicated that the core structure would remain intact during the move. Some 60 photographs were made through a 26-foot boroscope which contained its own light source. Large segments of insulation from around the vessel walls were found on the reactor room floor. 
indicating that the vessel may have raised several feet at the time of the excursion. A trial lift of the vessel was performed with a building service crane. This operation confirmed that the 13-ton vessel had jumped, shearing off the steam outlet and feed water pipes. This freed it to be raised from its supporting shell. Observers actually saw the sheared steam outlet as the vessel reached the peak of its three and a half foot trial lift. The entire operation was monitored and directed with the aid of closed circuit TV. The vessel was now ready for removal as soon as a seven foot hole could be cut in the operations room ceiling to accommodate the actual lift. cutting away of the fan room walls also was necessary in order to allow clearance for the bottom of the vessel and optimum positioning of the 60-ton capacity crane. To minimize the possibility of mishap, a complete mock-up operation was conducted just prior to the actual transfer. A concrete cylinder of approximate dimensions and weighted with gravel was used to test clearance, positioning, and maneuverability for the final lift. The simulated vessel was test hauled to the site in an available concrete cask, which was to provide radiation protection during the transport of the vessel and core. Additional gravel was spread next to the building to afford a level pad and a contamination-free surface for the truck tires. The mock-up exercise showed that six inches of additional building shell had to be removed to attain the necessary clearance. To contain and minimize the spread of contamination from the vessel proper, rubberized canvas with elastic bands was positioned over the top of the reactor on a steel frame. As the vessel was withdrawn, the accordion-like shroud automatically enveloped the vessel. As a final precaution against contamination, the tractor and low boy trailer were covered with sheets of plastic. The actual lifting and removal then proceeded smoothly. The entire operation, including transfer of the vessel to the trailer, required about 20 minutes. Radiation levels around the unshielded vessel during the transfer measured about 9R per hour at 25 feet. Good weather contributed to ideal operating conditions. The metal top was used to confine any loose contamination during transport. The following morning, November 30, 1961, the truck and cask were stripped of their protective plastic covers and steam cleaned. Direct radiation readings were only 40 to 50 millirentkins per hour at the surface of the cask. The 40-mile trip to the hot shop was accomplished without difficulty in less than four hours. The route had been cleared of overhead obstructions to accommodate the 24-foot high load. Precautionary surveys made sure that all bridge capacities were adequate for the 52-ton weight. The caravan, complete with emergency crews and tire changing equipment, did not disrupt the normal flow of traffic. A 160 foot long hot shop, equipped with remote manipulators, was ideally suited for the extensive task of vessel and core examination. It was originally used in the aircraft nuclear propulsion program. the silo-like reactor building and decontaminating the adjoining buildings and grounds. The fan room walls were cut with torches and removed with a crane. The heavy fan room floor was cut into three segments. The largest section with supporting I-beams was removed last. Despite the unique problems encountered, 
only one minor accident occurred during the recovery work. Further reduction of radiation exposure was accomplished by cleanup of loose contaminated debris after the vessel removal. Then followed removal of the operations room motor control panel, purification panel, turbine generator, pumps, piping, and walls, and eventually the stairway. Practically all that remained at that point was the concrete reactor operations floor and the lower shell of the building filled with gravel, which was spilled through weep holes and removed for burial. The 700 cubic yards of gravel was not highly contaminated as originally estimated. It ranged from 3 mR per hour for a handful of gravel taken from near the outside wall to 10 mR per hour for a sample that adjoined the reactor vessel support cylinder. Particulate airborne contamination was held to a minimum and careful surveillance was maintained by health physics personnel. It was decided that blasting would simplify removal of the 70-ton concrete floor. Preparation for this included cutting the wall, removing the superstructure, and placement of fallout paper at strategic locations to monitor aerosol contamination resulting from the blast. Two experts were called upon from the Army Demolition Section at Fort Belvoir, Virginia, to cut the six remaining I-beams supporting the concrete slab. Two days were expended in planning the demolition job, including preparation of the Composition C explosive in shape charge trays. The explosive was strategically placed to make sure the slab of concrete and steel would not fall against the surrounding buildings. upon which the entire building was erected came next. The remaining steel reinforced concrete piers which supported the entire structure yielded only with the help of a bulldozer and cutting torch. The radiation level at the surface of the ground where the reactor stood was finally reduced to less than one MR per hour by blading and backfilling with clean gravel and dirt. In all, it took five months to complete demolition of the reactor building. Meantime, decontamination of the adjoining buildings went forward using proven techniques. Vacuuming was ideal for decontaminating porous acoustical ceiling tile. The loose insulation in the attic of the support building was contaminated above allowable limits. It had to be removed by hand or by vacuuming. Salvageable items, such as telephones, desks, chairs, vending machines, tools, machinery, and control room equipment, went to the control point for decontamination. The more unwieldy or complex items were transported to the decontamination area. Gross steam cleaning and acid baths were employed on heavier equipment. The more delicate instruments were hand cleaned. High pressure hosing of the exterior metal walls aided in reducing the levels of loose contamination. Smear samplings monitored the effectiveness of decontamination at every step. Surveys made after each general cleaning determined the next course of action. The site grounds were scraped twice. Loose contaminated dirt was hauled to the burial ground. No heavy-duty equipment and vehicles were permitted to leave the contaminated zones before being steam cleaned. Next, a meticulous health physics survey revealed the remaining difficult and localized hot spots. These were removed with a shovel. Temporary roads, constructed to facilitate the recovery operations, were rolled up toward the burial ground, thus leaving a clean area behind and concentrating the remaining contamination in an ever-decreasing area until the last radioactive debris was contained. Personnel leaving the restricted contaminated zones shed their anti-contamination clothing in a trailer adjacent 
to the control point. They underwent complete monitoring inside a steel cubicle. Its purpose was to minimize residual background radiation from the surrounding area. No significant body contamination occurred during the recovery. Health physicists carefully recorded the name, time, and exposure for each personnel entry. Only 3% of the exposures exceeded the established limits of 3 rems per quarter whole body or 10 rems per quarter skin dose. The highest whole body exposure was 3.21 rems. Whole body counting sampled the effectiveness of face masks in preventing the inhalation of contaminated aerosol. In no case was there observed any whole body burdens above 10% of the recommended guide values. The badge belt was devised for obtaining a representative dose for the highly erratic and short range beta radiation. It was recognized early in phase three that the skin dose, beta plus gamma, would be the limiting criterion for personnel exposures. Thus the beta exposure was computed from the average beta to gamma ratio determined from the 18 badges around the waist. In general, the ratio varied from uh, 4.5 during the cleanup entries down to uh, 1.0 during the final stages of gravel removal. Whole body exposures during phase three were accumulated rapidly during the initial cleanup activity. As the project drew to an end, the exposure rate diminished to result in an overall expenditure of 1140 rems whole body. The average exposure per active participant was 2.6 rems for the entire 13 months of phase three. The same is generally true of the accumulated skin dose profile. The total of all exposures for all personnel during phase three was 3,850 rems skin dose. The recovery program beginning January 3rd, 1961, lasted 18 months. The whole body exposure data showed a high rate of bi-weekly expenditure during the phase one emergency period. This was followed by a relatively low rate during the four months of phase two, when no entries were allowed into the reactor building. This rate then increased for the phase three effort, during which the building was being dismantled and decontaminated. Gradual reduction in the rate followed as decontamination efforts took effect. A total of 1,240 persons participated in the recovery effort, of whom 790 were working in radiation fields at the SL-1 site. Most of them were affiliated with Combustion Engineering, HK Ferguson Company, General Electric Company, AEC, and the U.S. Army. ...was providing issue. Control rod racks, nuts, steel housings, C-clamps, and many other items were retrieved and decontaminated. These were then examined and sectioned or reassembled to understand better the part they played during the standing of a hot cell in laboratory analysis work. The components are scram shock spring and housing, shield plug body, guide tube, rack, extension rod, connecting rod, and the control rod blades which regulated the power output of the reactor core. Particular interest focused on the central control rod drive assembly. It was carefully dissected and examined for telltale evidence. As found, the central control rod appeared only slightly withdrawn. However, upon matching impact marks and scratches on the inside of the rod guide tube with those on the extension rod, it was revealed that the central control rod might have been almost entirely withdrawn at the time of the reactor excursion. Shield plugs for the outer control rods also underwent close scrutiny. This showed that an exceptionally high pressure had developed at the underside of the vessel head during the excursion. The magnitude of the high pressure was reflected in pronounced pinching and distortion of the extension tubes.
also in collision damage to the spring housings and flanges. Other itself continued to be the main focus of attention. Examination of the vessel internals could now proceed by direct means. This would not have been possible but for the partial shielding afforded by the cask. Technicians were able to look through the existing steam outlet hole with a boroscope into the vessel interior. The boroscoping revealed that all internal head connections were severed and head removal could proceed. Bulging of the vessel wall had caused the stud bolts on the flange to exert an inward pinching force on the head, making its removal difficult. The task was accomplished by driving wedges between the head and vessel flange with a crude, though effective, pendulum hammer. An unobstructed direct view of the vessel interior was now possible with the aid of a mirror and direct photography. The central control rod blade, locked in its shroud, could be seen lying on top of the damaged core. Removal of the central blade and shroud laid bare the true extent of damage to the reactor. The core was radially expanded and wedged against the thermal shield. Feed water spray rings were collapsed. The 16 element central region experienced severe melting, mechanical distortion, and complete disarrangement. A number of flux wires inserted just prior to the accident were also visible. The 24 element outer sections were squeezed between the disfigured cruciform shrouds and the thermal shield. Traces of solidified boric oxide could be seen as white streaks on the inside wall of the reactor vessel. Later, more detailed examination revealed a post-incident water level mark on the shrouds at approximately the same height as the top of the fuel elements. Core examination was augmented by boring eight two-inch holes around the perimeter of the vessel below the bottom of the core and thermal shield. Through these holes, Photographers obtained pictures of the entire bottom structure of the core and debris lying on the bottom of the vessel. The bulged vessel was then lifted from the cask and inserted into a holding fixture. Next, an eight inch hole was bored through the bottom of the vessel. The drill bit cut through the three quarter inch steel like a big cookie cutter. This allowed a large section of debris from the bottom of the vessel to be removed and examined. It was intended to recover the debris undisturbed to study material thought to be in sedimentary layers. However, during the sample removal operation, the plug was upset, thereby destroying any evidence that might have been gained from possible sedimentation. While the remaining debris was being scraped out, a TV camera with a monitoring screen in the gallery was positioned outside one of the two-inch holes in order to observe and direct the cleaning operation. Next, a critical experiment was conducted as an aid in determining the shutdown mechanism and to assess the possibility that multiple excursions had occurred. A specially adapted framework was placed in the hot shop to accommodate the experiment. The vessel was suspended by its flange into an aluminum tank deep enough to envelop the core area. Water could then be introduced into the vessel under controlled conditions through the eight inch hole in the vessel bottom. It was conjectured that the addition of water to the water level ring found at the top of the core might add enough moderating medium to achieve criticality. Five times the vessel was filled to six inches above the core without achieving criticality. Three of the filling operations used diluted acetic acid for washing boric acid from the fuel region. The last of these fillings was heated to 160 degrees Fahrenheit to speed the dissolving process. Samples of the dump water were obtained to analyze the effectiveness of boron removal. All but a trace of boric acid was washed from the fuel plates. The final filling was performed with demineralized water and as in previous fillings, very little neutron multiplication was observed. It was evident that the core was left greatly subcritical as a result of the accident. The effective multiplication factor was about six tenths, which is considerably below unity, the amount necessary for a self-sustaining chain reaction. The experiment was then terminated and preparations for disassembly commenced. 
Dissection of the vessel and core started with horizontal cutting of the vessel just below the top of the thermal shield. Removal of the top half of the vessel exposed the upper parts of the control rod shrouds. Manipulator access to the core was now greatly improved. The loose fuel plates, fuel elements, the core support structure and shrouds came out with little difficulty. The radial force of the excursion was apparent in the concave appearance of the outer control rod shrouds. All core parts were set aside in trays for analysis in the radioactive materials laboratory. Lastly, the thermal shield was extracted and the pressure vessel bottom completely vacuum cleaned. Central rod and shroud examination obviously took preference over other core components. The blade was observed to be bound in its shroud at a withdrawal distance of 20 inches. That the central blade did not slip within its shroud after the excursion was proven by the matching impact prints of the shroud circulation holes on the blade surface. Also by fuel residue splattered on the shroud and through the holes on the corresponding areas of the blade. Matching longitudinal rub marks found on the shroud and blade cladding were interrupted by oxide flaking or impact marks from the shroud weep holes thus indicating these rub marks were of pre-incident origin. The blade was cut in sections to provide chemical and metallurgical specimens for examination by SL-1 recovery personnel and requesting organizations. Gross accountability of fuel and burnable boron strips was undertaken by examining each element and plate, recording its identification number, approximating the amount of fuel or boron remaining, and mapping the results. From this it was deduced that the severest core damage was around the central control blade, decreasing radially outward. Approximately 50% of the center 16 elements had completely melted or otherwise failed. Flux wires running through the middle of these melted elements were relatively undamaged, however. Despite the high rate of fuel melting, cladding rupture, and the spewing of melted fuel, the immediate transfer of heat to the water left the adjacent aluminum cobalt flux fires unmelted. The remaining boron strips were gray in color, obviously brittle, and easily broken by hand manipulators. Approximately 92% of the fuel originally within the core was recovered from inside the reactor vessel. The remainder escaped from the vessel at the time of the accident. Fission product release was about 5%, which is not in complete agreement with the observed loss of fuel. Debris from the bottom of the vessel was sifted according to mesh size. Laboratory analysis revealed the major constituents to be uranium, aluminum, boron, iron, and indissolvable oxides. Close examination of the outer control rod blades revealed no movement from their relative rest positions in the core during the time of the accident. The undercore support structure was badly bent and twisted. Experts were called upon to examine the core for telltale signs of a chemical explosion. They found none. Representative boron strips, fuel plates, control rods, core structure, vessel walls, and thermal shield were sectioned for radiochemical, metallurgical, and physical examination and testing. The recovered aluminum cobalt flux wires, having no radiation history prior to the accident, served as excellent monitors for determining neutron flux profile and energy expended during the accident. The flux wire was of aluminum stock with tiny slugs containing cobalt in the shank every three inches. Meticulous care was exercised to decontaminate the wires, weigh, and dissolve the slugs, and count the specimens on a 256 channel analyzer. Then, by appropriately applying mathematical conversions, the flux numbers were obtained. 
After decontamination of the vessel head, shield plugs, and the center section of the reactor room ceiling, all items were reassembled in their original orientation for further studies to verify trajectories of the plugs and damage to the ceiling. Previously gathered evidence indicated that on the night of the accident, the three-man crew was in the process of connecting the control blades to the drive mechanism when the excursion occurred. Now, this is the routine procedure they were believed to be following. First, the shield plug is slipped down over the rack. The pinion gear housing and spring housing follow. The pinion gear is inserted in place. The lifting tool is then inserted into the spring housing and threaded onto the rack. The rack is then lifted a few inches out of the housing to place the C-clamp on the rack. The handling tool is lowered until the C-clamp rests on the spring housing, thus holding the assembly in place. The handling tool is removed and the retaining washer and nut are placed on the rack. The handling tool is screwed back on the rack. The handling tool and attachments are lifted to remove the C-clamp. It was near this point in assembly that the excursion occurred. Physical evidence shows that the nut, washer, and handling tool were on the central control rod at the time of the accident. The evidence was consistent with the possibility of hand withdrawal of the 85-pound central control rod blade to the 20-inch position. To test empirically that this is possible, a control rod drive mechanism was assembled over a pool of water and attempts were made to withdraw the rod with reasonable efforts and maximum efforts. Similar tests simulating stuck mechanism conditions were also conducted. All data were recorded on an oscilloscope. It was concluded from analyzing the data that an average man could withdraw the blade fast enough and far enough to reach the observed 20-inch final position before steam generation terminated the power excursion. The experiment further showed that a 20-inch withdrawal would not likely result from trying to free a frozen rod assembly. The animated scenes that follow depict the complex sequence of events that are believed to have occurred during the accident. It is important to remember that the whole sequence probably took place in less than four seconds. Direct cause of the accident clearly appears to have been manual withdrawal of the central control rod blade by one or more of the crew members considerably beyond the limits specified in maintenance procedure. However, there was insufficient evidence to establish the actual reason for such abnormal withdrawal. Now, in slower motion. Regardless of the withdrawal mechanism, the central control blade was lifted approximately 20 inches. This was 3 to 4 inches above its critical position of 16 to 17 inches. Approximately a 2% supercritical condition resulted, corresponding to a period of about 4 milliseconds. This supercritical configuration caused the rapid production of neutrons by fission for a total energy release of approximately 130 megawatt seconds. A metal water reaction probably contributed 20 MWS additional energy release. The fissions occurring within the fuel plates increase the temperature of these plates to a point near or above melting, depending upon location in the core. In the center regions of maximum neutron flux, the fuel within the plates experienced vaporization temperatures and burst the plate cladding. Thus, the spewing of hot vaporized fuel rapidly produced steam in the surrounding water. 
The steam was generated at a rate far faster than could be dissipated in the resulting outward expansion of this high-pressure steam bubble of at least 500 PSI damaged the core. The central blade was seized by the shroud surrounding it and the two became an integral unit. At this time of seizure, the central blade was withdrawn about 20 inches. The steam being generated pushed upon the water that was above the level of the core, forcing the slug of water upward from the core zone. It was stopped by the vessel head with a resultant water hammer causing peak pressures of about 10,000 PSI. While the water was moving upward, the core structure jumped, reaching a height of seven inches above its supports when the water hammer hit the head. As the water was decelerated upon striking the vessel head, the forces generated collapsed the shield plug guide tubes. It also deformed the vessel wall and the vessel head nozzles. Additionally, the momentum of this water as it struck the vessel head transferred its energy to the reactor vessel, imparting a vertical motion to the shield plugs and to the vessel itself. Some biological shielding material was ejected from its container on the vessel head. The vessel jumped approximately nine feet, sharing the connecting pipes and expelling some of the surrounding thermal insulation. Simultaneously with the vessel lift, the pressure within the vessel expelled the unbolted shield plugs. The ejected shield plugs came to rest in various locations. Number four in the fan duct, number three on the fan floor, number one and number seven in the operating room ceiling. The central plug hit the ceiling and fell back on the vessel head as the vessel dropped back to its original position. Reconstruction of the movement of the central mechanism gives greater insight into the physical damage observed on the rod. Initially, the rod was withdrawn approximately 20 inches. As a result of the core jumping during excursion, the central rod was moved upward an additional seven inches. The water hammer pressure then bound the rod and tube together at this relative position of 27 inches. The plug and rod were accelerated as a unit from the nozzle by the high pressure. Upon hitting the ceiling, the handling tool snapped the threaded end of the rack, impaling the tool into the ceiling. The impact also broke the rack inside the plug and simultaneously caused the plug to slip back up the rod to the fully inserted position. The plug flange then hit the overhead structure and the fractured rack continued into the fan room. The plug fell back onto the vessel head, snapping the connecting rod after it had been driven upward through the plug about three inches. The scratch mark evidence and matching marks on the tube and extension explain the seeming discrepancy of finding the central shield plug with the final rod withdrawal position only three inches above the normal zero position. The accident unfortunately terminated more than two years of successful SL-1 operation, during which valuable nuclear technology was gained. At the same time, lessons learned from the accident itself must be fully exploited for the betterment of atomic industry as a whole. Recognizing that Future nuclear incidents, if any, will differ in degree and complexity. The SL-1 experience has emphasized several considerations. Extensive and detailed emergency pre-planning is a necessity for any reactor site if personnel are to be protected from hazards such as large radiation exposures. It is important that all necessary emergency equipment be immediately available. Adequate manpower available on short notice is needed to execute a recovery program as large as that of the SL-1. This manpower should include uh, chemists, physicists, engineers of all kinds, nuclear consultants, physicians and nurses, health physicists, photographers, technicians, 
and laborers. Judicious management of radiation exposure is a necessity for any recovery effort of this kind. Large quantities of contaminated debris and high beta radiation present in the SL-1 emergency made it necessary to devise certain additional control procedures for adequate personnel protection. Reactor safety reviews of AEC owned and licensed reactors are now even more frequent and detailed than before the accident and pertain to every phase of operations and design. Nuclear and physical characteristics of the SL-1 excursion are strongly influencing the hazard analyses for future reactor systems. Assignments of responsibility for reactor safety are more clearly defined. And there is a new awareness of the potential nuclear hazards which may exist while a reactor is shut down and routine maintenance is being performed. The recovery program proved that dismantling in place is not always necessary to obtain undisturbed scientific evidence. A damaged vessel and core can be successfully removed and transported long distances for analysis under laboratory conditions. The overall recovery program, including phase three as well as phases one and two, cost two and a half million dollars. Losses in capital equipment totaled another million and a half dollars. There has been a valuable return on these expenditures in the form of newly acquired data on nuclear safety and accident procedures. It is tragic that three lives were lost. Nevertheless, the information developed and the lessons learned will help prevent similar accidents in the future, will help save lives, and aid in the safe development of our nuclear technology. The SL-1 reactor building has been dismantled and removed, but a scientific legacy remains for all who are charged with the safe operation of nuclear reactors.